In today's Reframe Tune-In, James is chatting to counsellor and self-acceptance specialist Maliki Dunn. Maliki is founder of the counselling practice, training centre and wellness clinic called Lifetime Therapy. Now, Maliki's humanistic counselling approach is very much aligned with our work here at Reframe Club, focusing on the power of compassion and how through compassion for both ourselves and others, we can heal and grow. So without further ado, we bring you Maliki and James's chat. Hi Maliki, thanks for joining us today. Could you just tell the Reframe members a little bit about yourself, what it is you do and your work around the body acceptance? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a therapist, I'm a, a counsellor, a psychotherapist, and I struggle with the difference between those two things. I think a lot of that is to do with cost rather than um, competency. Uh, and I've been doing that for over 10 years now, and uh, I've been in therapy myself on and off for nigh on 40 years. Um, I'm a 60 year old man, you can see that. Um, you can see, well, hopefully it doesn't look that I'm 60, but you know, I, I am 60 and uh, perhaps been a bit preoccupied with that this last, this last year or so. Uh, I have a practice in Truro and it's um, a, what we call a person centered practice. So a lot of our work is based on acceptance anyway. People, people, when people accept themselves, then change becomes really possible. And I have a couple of associates there who, and we put on body acceptance workshops. Um, we are, sorry, I'm just pausing to think there. They are really interesting workshops and we come at, we, we look at body acceptance in lots of different ways. One that um, w as people, uh, we're subject to a lot of advertising. We spend, a, a lot of time being bombarded with messages that we are not okay so that we will spend a lot of money changing the way we are to a way that's unachievable and that's in our appearance in what we do what we buy what we wear and our body acceptance workshops are i suppose a um, a way of helping people find freedom from a from a lot of those messages that we receive from advertising and we receive all our life so that people feel a bit more freedom. There you go, simple answer. Beautiful answer. Well, um, you said acceptance a lot there. Um, yeah. What exactly do you mean by acceptance? I know we've, we've had main discussions and it always yeah, comes we, up, Jim, accept the situation, accept the now yeah. you're in. Yeah. Okay, what do I mean by accepting? Right. Um, and as you know, I, I spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and I, I spent a lot of kind of, um, study time uh, working on acceptance and it's part of my it really is part of my life's work to help people find acceptance and I think the best place to start with acceptance to find out what it is is to define what it isn't and that helps it really helps people narrow it down and uh, and it gets confused with things that it's quite similar to so the first thing it's not is understanding. It's not about knowing why. Um, a lot of people will come to me wanting to know why they are a certain way. And one of the things that I've really found out is that knowing why isn't really a useful thing anyway, because what happens is we'll just land on the first plausible why and we'll sit there for a minute and if we're a kind of why sort of person, one of those people who continually ask, we'll just look for another why, and then we'll look for another why. So there's not a lot of peace in understanding. The other thing that it, another thing that it isn't is resignation. So resignation is an idea that this is how it is, and this is how it will always be. And resignation is a really heavy leaden feeling, you know. We've probably all experienced that, you know, that, that just that idea of, oh, this is how it is. This is how it will always be. It's a bit like me sometimes when I'm lifting weights with you, Jimmy, and I think, oh, I'll never get there, you know, that feeling. And, the, and you say to me, oh, well, that's not true, you know, it's just how it is today. The third thing that it gets confused with is tolerance. 
tolerance it's not a putting up with feeling it tolerance looks like this can you see how my knuckles are white yeah it's hanging on for dear life you know and as we all know you know in your context there's nobody can hang on hang on to a bar forever you know tolerance is always finite and it's um it just doesn't work as a concept for tr for trying to deal with issues you know putting up with them we can put up with things for so long but eventually we, we will often snap or break or break down often so acceptance is an attitude and what i mean by an attitude it's half thought and half feeling and it's an attitude that says this is just how it is right now in this moment you know that's that's what acceptance is and it's difficult it's a really simple thing that is very difficult to achieve because simple things as you know very well i mean a deadlift is a really simple thing isn't it you bend over keep your back straight get all everything in line and lift the weight it's really simple and it's a really difficult thing to do and and the same with acceptance and it's something again it's the similarity with the work that i know that you do with me it's a, a thing that we can practice and it's a thing that we can build up to get better and better at i really so like that you know yeah. i was thinking going back to tolerance so your tolerance you're right knuckling it and you're holding on for dear life yeah would you say once that tolerance breaks and you go into what stage four i guess is the acceptance stage I'm not saying the are stages but if you were to place them out yeah. of that yeah. Would that then build resilience or how would you, where does resilience fall into that? Where does resilience fall into Resilience with acceptance. <laughs> another aspect or another way uh, that I work with people is moving away. Oh, sorry about that. That's just, I can't stop that happening. So if it okay, no in, it's in a, it, it shows we're real. Um, anyway. Another way that I work or another aspect or another kind of um, way of helping people is that we move. When people first come to me, they're, they're often very reactive. And what I mean by that is they'll have a feeling and they just bounce off that feeling and often um, and they'll react to their feelings. I call it their feelings on them. They're reactive. Yeah. And over time, it is possible through acceptance to get to a place where we're much more responsive. So we'll have a feeling and we'll be able then to consider what we do and then choose our behavior. Does that make sense? And so that resilience is the ability to have an emotion experience it know what it is and then make a choice of behavior in relation to it or not and that sounds like a really long process but over time with practice that be just that is how we can become i really like that and i think from where i come from you can definitely relate that to what we, what we do at reframe club with intuitive movement you know some days you're going to feel great and you want to lift that big deadlift to the floor because you've got the energy and you're roaring and some days you simply haven't got that energy and you know yeah. when to push and when not to push because you you know the outcome is going to be you're going to feel good for it because you experienced it or you know today's not the day i've learned yeah. that and you can find it with the biscuit tin as well i guess can you absolutely you can really apply that to emotions as well because a lot of the distress around difficult emotions is not the difficult emotion itself it's us either pushing ourselves into it or pushing the emotion away when we kind of let things flow intuitively naturally should we say when we let them flow naturally then all of that pushing away pulling that kind of push me pull you energy has gone away and it leaves us space i i talk about kind of therapeutic space for stuff to happen for us to be rather than us to do you know one of the things that i talk to people who come to me is that the process can be from becoming uh, from having been a reactive i call them human doings to a responsive human being 
and that I think that really fits with with what you're doing there. It's about being the exercise, being the eating, rather than doing it in a, in a, a really conscious, forced forced way. Yeah, that, no, there's no associated with guilt or pressures that you need to do. Absolutely, like yeah. You know, food is a natural thing that we all need. Exercise is a natural thing that we all need. But, you know, the imposition of it, you see, imposition and prohibition don't work. And I'll give you an example. I'll give anyone who's listening to this an example right now. Don't think about a pink elephant. Yeah, straight in my head, massive pink elephant. There you go. So prohibition doesn't work, yeah? And if I say to you, think about a pink elephant, the same thing, you know, it, it doesn't work. So our minds respond best to invitation you know invitation is a much more gentle way you know if we invite ourselves to explore things if we invite ourselves to explore feelings if we invite ourselves to accept things now can i is it all right to talk a bit more about acceptance and things that we've talked about in the past yeah no absolutely please just I remember we we talked about the acceptance gym as a concept. Yeah. Um, and, and you see, what happens in gyms often is what happens with acceptance. People go along there really wanting to get fit and they do too much too soon, get sore and don't come back. That would be, you know, you, you, you work with people. Yeah, you see that a lot. Yeah, and, yeah. and actually, I, I think in your in your other career, that's that's a lot of what you, you you work with people who've done that, don't you? And I can remember when I first met you, thinking, hmm, this isn't hard enough. You know, I I, I wasn't sore enough when I when I'd finished at first. You know, because part part of me really wanted to do too much so that I didn't have to do any more, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that largely comes to the industry. You know, we're constantly bombarded on social media and magazines that yeah. um, even in the sense of bodybuilding, if I put it in bodybuilding terms, um, you need to eat loads of calories and train really hard to your sore and you can't move, and then you gain mass, and you need yeah. to drop all those calories and cut right back down for the summer so you lose it, but you can only do it with these supplements and these diets. And the truth is, it's, it's not a quick fix like that, and it's a gentle gentle journey but there's no money in a nice long gentle journey no because you, you know there's no money in a gentle journey I, I, yeah i would agree yeah and it's interesting uh, hearing you say that i'm thinking about the word that comes to my mind is compassionate you know a compassionate way isn't you know it's not exciting enough for the people who sell this stuff you know um anyway to go back to the acceptance thing often people try to accept things that are too difficult to accept at first and what we have to do is to build up our capacity our acceptance muscles i call them and it is possible to build up our capacity to accept more and more difficult things i'm a great believer in um, the concept of neuroplasticity no, you have to you have to explain I mean, it's neuroplasticity. Basically, in our head, we can change the way we think with practice, with conscious practice, we can change the way we think. There's loads of evidence that we can do that throughout our lives. The old wisdom was that once we reached 30, our brain cells were dying off and we were basically on a, a downhill slope. But new, new research says that we can be creating new neural connections in our brains right into our 90s so and i know that's true for me because i know i exercise my and you know that about me i exercise my brain a lot and i'm continually coming up with new ideas new ways of thinking different ways of kind of being with my thoughts and the more you do it the, the more you can do it just like any other fitness regime yeah and so we can do that with acceptance and say we have a really difficult thing that we might need to accept say somebody comes to me and they've had a really tragic bereavement for example yeah and you know they can't accept that their love their loved one has gone you know that's that's just too big a weight to lift and so 
what we might look at is the fact, accepting the fact that they can't accept it. And if that's too difficult still, we might even accept that it's a struggle for them to accept that they can't accept that they can't accept it, which might sound a little bit convoluted. But once we arrive at the exact level of somebody's capacity, the acceptance comes. Yeah, that, that's the, the first sort of baby step to realizing the first baby that step they're on a journey with it. Yeah, I often use something you've done with me many times as an example. And I talk about we do acceptance in the negative. You know that thing? That, um, I'm not going to mention her name, but she's a really courageous woman who comes and trains with, at the same time as me in the morning. And it took her about two years to do yeah, a push-up. Yeah. yeah. And she did them in the negative. She got in the position and she lowered herself. She got in the position and she lowered it. And we do the same with acceptance. Sometimes accepting that we can't accept is the best sort of accepting that we can do. Have you found there's any sort of difference with people you've worked with and working on acceptance within gender and why you think that might be? <laughs> if there is a difference at all. I don't think I have really. I don't think I have. No. Okay, that's that one. I tell you, I tell you a thought that I do have. The people who struggle with it most at first are often the people who get it most effectively, and I'm not going to say best, most effectively in the end. You know, they're kind of catapulted from one end to the other. Yes. So if I was someone who's on the why now, so I'm always asking the why. I found, oh, sorry, looking for the why, as you better yeah. say. Um, yeah. This is what this I am this way because of this, and that's why I'm it. That's my answer. Um, how would I then go about finding that acceptance? Would you okay. say as simple as I need to accept that the why is not not be able to end all? Or well, I, well, I wouldn't even go there really. I'd just begin to. Another thing that I'm really interested in is we use words, you know, and just. I, I would I would invite someone to just to begin noticing every time that they use why, just to notice that. And when we start noticing it, we get better at noticing it. And then I might uh, invite somebody to uh, every time they use why, let's let's start looking at that instead. So rather than why things happen, let's just accept that things happen. Yeah, yeah? and it's it's just a different energy, you know. Because we rarely will we know why everything happens, but we can accept that things happen. And another question I'll, I will ask people who I work with, which would you prefer? The answer to every question or the, the ability to live with unanswered questions? I'm going to ask you that right well, now. The ability to live with unanswered questions for... Or the answer to every question. Oh, I don't know right now. I think I like the answer to every question. Yeah, but can you see how one of those that is right? H having it's to limiting know, there, isn't it? I imagine that's limiting. Yeah, it's it, having to know the answer to every question is a really kind of reactive energy, whereas the ability to live with unanswered questions is a kind of responsive energy. Yes, and I can imagine if you put it in old sort of philosophical terms, if you're happy to have unanswered questions, you can answer probably more, or ask more questions and therefore... Absolutely, yeah, yeah, that's right. The paradoxical thing is more answers arrive when we can live with, when we can live without them. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. See what we've got on here, Maliki. So... How can people start practicing um, cultivating body acceptance? With uh, the, using, so let's use the acceptance gym as an example. Right, okay. Well, I think there are loads of ways. One, one I think the, the first thing that could be really useful there is to accept that it's really difficult. Yeah, cultivating body, you know, we will have been bombarded throughout, throughout our lives, consciously, unconsciously, um, that our body shape 
isn't how it should be. You know, there are people out there who have immense resources who employ very clever people to stimulate a feeling to make us do what they want. And the feeling they stimulate is shame. They stimulate our, our shame reactions so that we'll go and sign up to a regime, buy a load of, um, you know, diet shakes, uh, you know, join Weight Watchers. The, the thing that advertisers use is shame to make us, to, to, to make us behave. So learn, just be, accepting that fact, first of all, is really useful. And then accepting that it's really difficult to, uh, to, to begin a process of body acceptance. Accepting that doing it in a group or doing it with, um, with people who know what they're doing can be really useful. Accept, accepting that doing that on your own is a really difficult thing. And reaching out for help is a really useful thing. Having that community support. Community support. And that that community support, going back to what we talked about right at the beginning, is a thing, it will give us something that no amount of willpower can give us. It will give us a sense of accountability. And accountability and acceptance are far more um, effective factors in human change than willpower and motivation. There's loads of research around that. When you talk about accountability here, I'm assuming you don't mean in the sense of um, I'm ringing you up saying, Maliki, have you done X, Y, and Z today? No, I'm not. I'm You're saying, much more gentle. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's an um, acceptance-based accountability, yeah? Yeah. So it would, it, would be, it would be for me to say, oh, I'm going to do this, do it, and then tell somebody when I've done it, knowing that if... I didn't do it they wouldn't care about me less they wouldn't value me any less they wouldn't accept me any less and yeah. the, the fact that i know that their level of acceptance wouldn't change whether i did it or not paradoxically makes me more likely to do it yeah yeah acceptance is difficult because it hinges on a paradox and for some people particularly why people people who like to know why paradoxes are really difficult because they are things that don't make sense that make sense or that make sense that don't make sense it doesn't matter which way around you put them but for that that blows fuses for for why people whereas for that people which i'm fortunate to, enough to have made myself paradoxes a paradox is yeah which is it, it's a bit of a mind confuser. So I'm stuck in that sort of um, why mindset. Yeah. Which maybe was highlighted from your question earlier when I said I'd want the answers. Yeah. Um, how could that lack of, if you're a bit to acceptance uh, in myself, so say in terms of I was so concerned about having a ripped six pack for the summer and I didn't want to take my shirt off on the beach unless it was spot on. Yeah. I don't, by the way, but if I was. I was in that mindset and the media was telling me, yeah, you know, I can do that. You, you, you can relate to it, right? It, it, the yeah. stress is there. So if I've got that and I haven't accepted that it's okay to um, yeah. just be, how would that negatively affect my mindset on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, negative is not a word that I use a great deal. Um, I think what comes to mind is, if we start from a compassionate place, very little can go wrong, yeah? So let's find some compassion for, let's find some compassion for, for me right now in relation to that, you know? I've been here in lockdown, I've been here for two months. I'm a good cook, you know, I know I'm a good cook and I've probably put on a bit of weight. I haven't probably trained quite as much. Let's just be compassionate for that person and realize that, in the circumstances, I'm doing the best that I can. Yeah. Just find a bit of acceptance there, you know? Accept the fact that sometimes 
I am still subject to those shame messages that the advertisers send out. I still am, you know, and I, so I, it comes I, back to that, doesn't it, really? It's it does, just yeah. Being able to filter out that shame that there's those advertisers that are telling me that I would need to be a certain way to take my shirt off at the beach. When reality is, I'm missing out on a beautiful sunny day with my friends where I can be swimming in the sea. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just be compassionate for that fact. Be kind, be kind to that aspect of ourselves. Because telling it to go away or going back to the pink elephant, telling it that it shouldn't think like that only makes it think like that more. Yeah. So I'm always trying to say, we all, I guess if you always put restrictions on yourself um, yeah. or pressuring yourself to train or restrictions yourself in terms of nutrition, yeah. you're going to, yeah. you're going to think of the pink elephant. You're going to, you're going to break. It, yeah. It's always tolerance, which is unsustainable. You know, you'll put up with it, but you won't, it's not sustainable. I'm really interested in sustainability of people. Yeah, and acceptance is a, is a, it's in fact it's, it goes beyond sustainability to a really interesting word called regenerative. The more we do it, the more we'll do it. Yeah, you know, it's not just sustainable; it's it increases. And that's when that long journey comes in. We spoke about, I guess, isn't it? It's not yeah. you're not just trying to rush to get to a certain place. You're understanding that okay, the first there step isn't place to go. Sorry. There isn't there isn't anywhere to get to. No, apart from what we're, we're shamed into telling us where we need to be. Absolutely. We're to we are told there's an ideal place. And, this, uh, and what they really cleverly do is you, get, you approach that place and they bloody move it. Excuse my French. That's true. So have you got any tips for people who, who struggle with that? So, for instance, um, maybe they could remove certain things from their social media. What else could they do to minimize that? shame feel right okay and this is going to sound it's a bit left field and it's a bit um tangential right one of the consequences of living with shame and anxiety because they, they come together is that we produce produce cortisol and adrenaline in our body that's you know because they, they are the, uh, the, the chemicals we produce in response to those. And if we practice gratitude every day, if we record three things that we're grateful for in, in any way, shape or form, you know, I, I do it on a Facebook group, but people do it in a journal. Some people just do it verbally. Some people will do it as a family at, you know, at the dinner table. If people, are consciously grateful every day that that starts changing how we think different neurons in our brain will wire together and it produces oxytocin which is the the antidote to the adrenaline and the cortisol the cortisol and, is our stress hormone isn't it and it is yeah because living in shame all the time is stress and you probably know loads of physiological stuff about what people do in terms of eating and cortisol because it you know we, we numb it out through eating and all well i've yeah. spent a lot of time yeah no it's a definite link it's a definite link yeah. so although it might sound a bit left field practicing gratitude will really begin to give us some space whereby we can move away from the why questions and just start living with the that the thatness i call it of everything and i love that it's good yeah. so if you had a billboard um a massive billboard the whole world's going to see this billboard maliki yeah what are you sticking on it what am i sticking on the billboard uh apart from my website <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay um Stick that on our website. yeah I, i'm going to go back to uh, uh, kind of one of my heroes, one of my great heroes, a man called Carl Rogers, who, who was the founder of the sort of therapy that I was trained in originally and practice a ver my own version of now. And he talked about empathy, acceptance, and honesty. He didn't quite use those words, but empathy, acceptance, and honesty. Nice. If the world, if the world was based on that, it would be a better place, I think. And you can apply it to everything, can't you? 
absolutely. Yes, brilliant. And how can the Reframe Club members, they want to know a little bit more about you, get in touch, um, read your blogs, how do you do that? If you go to my website, which is lifetimetherapy.co.uk, there's lots of stuff on there. There's a journal page and there's far more than, there's loads of stuff on there about acceptance, about gratitude, about vulnerability, about being a man in the world as well, uh, and how we get specific messages uh, about how it's not okay to be emotional or have emotions. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all on there, uh, lifetimetherapy.co.uk. Brilliant, thank you uh, very much for today, man. We do work remotely all over the world as well. So, Thank you for tuning in. And we hope you have taken something away from listening. Perhaps one small action you can put into practice today. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. So pop on over to Reframe Club where you can share them, your own reflections and experiences. We would love to hear from you. As always, here at Reframe Club, we are rooting for you.